today is a Yiddish poet. So you see how linguistically complicated this is. And, um, and I did not choose this because of complication. I chose it because of, it seemed to me, um, simplicity, directness. I am not a historian. I am a teacher of literature, and I chose literature quite consciously because it seemed to me the discipline that, um, that was most inclusive, uh, that took in everything. And um, one of the poets and one of the uh, writers who does this most for me is Avraham Sutzkever, whom I would like to speak about. So one of the ways of beginning this seminar series that you're here for would have been to have a lecture, an introductory lecture about the language wars, about the history. Hopefully all of this will happen in the time that you're here. So I will begin at the other end from a very narrow uh, opening. One poet and uh, to say a little bit about him, of course, by way of introduction, but mostly to focus, if I can get there, on two of his poems. He was one of the most prolific modern poets, not just in Yiddish, but in any modern language. And yet, so just to choose two poems is even to be, to make it even smaller in some ways. And um, if I may, um, I didn't think to do this, but, um, one of my friends and one of the great American Jewish writers is Cynthia Ozick. She is a very well-known American writer and a Jewish writer. And she, speaking in Jerusalem once, was talking about this question of languages. And here's what she said. She said, many Jewish writers, and I think this is true of other, language, of other writers in smaller languages, what they try to do is to use universal themes and to try to strike a universal chord. She says, but literature is like the shofar. You know the shofar is the instrument that one blows in the synagogue. It goes back to temple days when one blew it on the mountains to announce the um, the, the hours, the way the Moezin do it now, right? So the shofar, though, it, you blow through a very, very narrow hole. What she said was, and it's a beautiful me a, a metaphor, if you blow through the wide hole, there is no sound. And the only way to make the sound go is to blow through the narrow hole of the shofar, right? Of the, of the instrument. So this is uh, what I will use as the metaphor uh, for this. To open up the subject, it may be best to start from the narrow hole rather than to try to do the hole. Um, but I would just add one other thing. There are, uh, you know, when I teach and when we try to introduce Yiddish literature to various groups and to introduce a poem poet like Sutzkever to people who don't know of him. Um, I've been teaching mostly in America. I do a little bit of teaching here in Israel to, is, to Israeli students. It seems to me that Sutzkever belongs most to you. That, in other words, if there is a group of people who can understand him more intuitively because of their own cultural background, Believe it or not, it is you, because Sutzkever comes from Russia. And uh, even though his native culture was Yiddish, um, and then Polish, but he learned Russian and he became deeply steeped in Russian literature. He spent, as I will point out, some time in Moscow, and he came to this land from Russia. And um, this is his cultural background. And I think that you will see from what I intend to say about his life, how much he belongs to you. So strange as this may seem, in all this strangeness of languages and so forth, my point to you would be that if there is an affinity, some of the natural affinity that one feels, 
I sense that your affinity may be even at least geographically and in some sense culturally closer than mine, who comes out of a deeply Yiddish uh, background. So Sutzkever then, who was born in 1913 um, in Smorgon, which is a smaller city near Vilna, Vilnius, which is today, of course, in Lithuania, um, born in 1913, so the date tells you that this is just before the outbreak of the First World War. And indeed, um, when he was one and a half years old, the youngest of three children, the Jews were expelled basically from Smorgon because the war, First World War had broken out. The Russians considered the Jews a fifth column at this point, and so the Jews were really basically driven. It was a, a town uh, with at least half the population was Jewish, but they were driven out. And the Sutskever family, father and mother and the three children, went to Omsk in Siberia. And um, so by 1915, at one and a half years old, Sutskever was in Omsk, and that's where he spent his childhood, in Siberia. Um, now, this would normally be just a detail in somebody's biography. He spent the years from one and a half years old until he was seven and a half years old, till 1920, 21, till actually World War I was officially over. Um, he spent them in Siberia. This becomes not just an incident, but the most crucial element in his biography. How is that? Well, what is Siberia? If I say Siberia to almost anybody, it's a, it's a wasteland. It is, uh, it is uh, a gulag. For Jews, it was called Fashikung. You were exiled to Siberia. And a lot of Yiddish poetry and a lot of, um, a lot of Yiddish uh, memoirs are about the horrors of living in Siberia, of being driven, exiled to Siberia. Sutskever's father died in Siberia, died when the boy was seven years old. His sister became very ill and eventually later died from the illness that she uh, first got in Siberia. Um, I, I think it's an almost unrelieved idea of suffering, of um, danger. Um, but when Sutskever began to write as a poet, this is already in the 1920s, I'll go forward, um, what he did was to create a myth of himself as the Yiddish poet who comes out of Siberia. His name is Avraham, Abraham, and what he creates really is the new myth, a new Jewish myth of beginnings, of genesis, of origins. And what is that? He is not an Abraham uh, who is going to Canaan. He's not an Abraham from the south in the hot sun with which Judaism is identified. No, he is the Abraham who comes out of the north, out of Siberia. and. He creates his childhood in this wondrous way. He, um, if you read his, his uh, early poems of, of uh, Siberia, illustrated, by the way, by Marc Chagall, they are magical. He, he creates a magical wonderland of snow. And in this magical wonderland of snow, the boy poet is born. The, the boy poet is born. Right? He is born in this wonderland of color, in this wonderland of bells on the sleds tingling, in, of the sun coming up, of the sparkling diamonds of the snow. The language is so inventive and gorgeous, and somehow he transforms what Siberia has been almost universally to everybody into a completely different construct. He, that's how the poet is born out of Siberia. 
and Dafka, and particularly at the death of his father. So one of the scenes in the poem that he eventually creates of this is that the little boy of seven accompanies his father to his grave. They dig the grave in the snow, and the child is tempted to jump into the grave and join, as he says, his father in that little hut in the ground. But at the last minute, a dove, a dove, which has been nestling in his shirt, a dove flies out from his shirt and flies up to the sun and the child is captivated by this image of the dove flying out to the sun. And that is, in a sense, how the poet in him is born. Instead of going to join his father in that hut in the ground, he is drawn by that dove upward into uh, life and into light and into joy of poetry, of invention, of creativity, of transformation. So this is, this is how he experiences, in some sense, this is how he invents his childhood. And in some way, it must have been how he experienced his childhood, because you cannot completely invent that if you did not in some way experience it. And, um, and although it is all in the language of poetry, you see, um, and not in the language, by the way, of Judaism. I said this about Abraham from the north, but this is not in the poem in any way. But what there is in this, if you notice, is a reversal of the Akedah, of the most famous, perhaps, story in Jewish mythology, in Jewish biblical language, is the most famous story, is the story of Abraham, who brings his son Isaac, and is told that he must bring him and kill him as an offering, and Abraham is ready to do this. And only at the last minute, uh, a ram is substituted for that, and so the child Isaac is saved. You know, it's a story that has haunted the Jewish imagination, the Christian imagination, the world's imagination. It's a very deep story. You see what this story of Sutzkevers has done. It has completely inverted that. It is the child who comes and who actually buries his father, right? But the child is the one who feels himself rescued in some form and must go forth. And in a way, um, I must apologize to you. Um, you know, I am not a mystical person. I sometimes say I don't have a spiritual bone in my body. I am very, very uh, logically oriented. Um, you know, Kabbalah is something that I would never have touched in a million years. So this idea of this mystical, I, I am not naturally given to this kind of language. Uh, there's a mu much more about Sutzkever, but I'm trying to just represent him in the way in which he invented and understood himself. And I think you will see how important this was. This is not something that could have been recreated ex post facto. He could not have done this afterwards in his life. This is something that was innate almost in him. And this is just the person who comes out and who becomes this poet of whom we speak. So then, what happens to this boy? When he is seven and a half years old, the father has died in Siberia, the war is now over, the mother takes the three children and can't go back to Smorgon because Smorgon, as they knew it, is no longer available to them. So she takes them to the larger city of Vilna, and that is where Sutzkever spends the years from 1920 until 1943, right? And so this is his adolescence and his beginnings as a poet. Now, if there was a magical time in Jewish life, believe it or not, from my perspective, it's Vilna in the interwar period. My parents, 
come from Vilna in the interwar period. And all my life, I never felt I had a youth, also yours. So, because in our household, if you talked about young people singing, inventing, doing wonderful things, it was all Vilna in the 1920s and 1930s. Now, if you're an historian of Jews in Vilna in the 1930s, this is not what you read. Poverty, total poverty, really great widespread poverty. Anti-Semitism is on the rise. Why? Because in the uh, division after World War I, Vilna became part of Poland. And, and the Poles became fiercely pro-Polish nationalistic. And part of that nationalism, by no means all of it, but part of that nationalism was anti-Semitism in the sense that it was anti all other minorities. So if you read about Vilna in the 1920s and 1930s, you will read about hunger, starvation. And by the way, if you read about the group with which Sutzkever became associated, called Jung Vilna, a group of poets and artists who had their beginnings in Vilna in the 1920s. What will you read? Social protest, organizing for labor, organizing for national rights, organizing for doing things demonstratively and all the rest. This is really the spirit. Um, and it was also, by the way, um, in reaction to Polish nationalism, and in reaction, in a sense, to uh, what was happening in the Soviet Union, which was nationalism in another form, in a communist form, Jews in Vilna, and not just there, but there I would say even more than in other areas, became fiercely, fiercely Jude nationalistic in a certain sense. Some became Zionists, but others became very much involved in Yiddish culture. So that I will just say, Sutzkever, of course, was part of this movement. But in just in our own case, my mother grew up with um, uh, 10 half brothers and sisters. They all spoke Russian because it was, Vilna was Russian before the First World War. They all spoke Russian. My mother, growing up in the post-war World War I period, was a fiercely Yiddish speaker. And uh, my father grew up in that, uh, who went to uh, Stefan Batora University. Their whole gang was Yiddish. And it was Yiddish not as uh, one might imagine. It was Yiddish because this is our, uh, this was belonged to us, um, right? This is ours. And they would sing songs about, oh, the Polish assimilating Jewish girls Oh, they speak Polish, and they talk about Przybyszewski, and they talk about the Polish writers. Yeah, 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 but, you know, and they say, Polish is a voile sprach, Yiddish is a mere Polish is a wonderful language, Yiddish is an ugly thing. And then the last verse of this is, but voje voje tut men vos, vos tut men mit der Yiddish er nos. Das wird se nicht der, du wirst se nicht der kennen, die Jidufskes vos se zenen. And then they turn it around. Yiddish is a schöne Sprach, Polish is a mir se sach. Do, do you follow me? That in other words, this song about the assimilationists was sung you see, they pretend to be Polonized, and they say Polish is beautiful and Yiddish is ugly. But then using the stereotype of the Jewish nose, they say, oh, but kiddo, you are just fooling yourself. You're going to be recognized. And when you're recognized as a Jew, let's face it, Yiddish is a beautiful thing, and Polish is an ugly language. It becomes very aggressive. And I mention this really because this is part of this this is part of what was going on in Vilna. By the way, it became the center of Jewish scholarship. The YIVO Institute for Jewish Research was founded in Vilna deliberately because they chose that place. Um, it was a very cultured city on all levels. So Sutzkever becomes a poet associated with Jung Vilna, but here is why this Siberia thing is so interesting. When he comes 
to be tested by the group, because the group did not just take in anyone who wanted to be a poet and writer a member. They, you had to have an interview. You had to be accepted into the group. When he came, instead of reading the kind of poem that he could have written and that would have gotten him in, he wrote, he wrote these, he read these poems about Kyrgyzian, Kyrgyzians and snowmen in Siberia and this wonderland of Siberia. They didn't accept him in the group. They wouldn't accept him. It took him some time to be accepted, but he would not be accepted on their terms. And these were guys who were his friends. They played soccer together. I mean, what are we talking about here? We're not talking about two different hierarchies. These were his neighbors and friends. But he would not pretend to be a different kind of poet, even to get into this group of poets of his friends. And so this is the kind of poetry he began to write then in the 1930s when he was in his 20s. And this is the sort of poet that he became. Now, for all that, um, you can create an alternative world. And some of you may involve, be involved in some ways, living an alternative world, culturally different from people around you. But history is real, and politics is real. And there comes a time in, in some people's lives, unfortunately, when that alternative world cannot be sustained in any physical way. And so uh, in 1939, um, the Hitler-Stalin Pact um, came into being. Germany took over half of Poland. The Soviet Union took over the other half of Poland. And uh, the war broke out for the first little while, for two years, Vilna was in the Soviet zone. And so people from the German zone flooded into Vilna, even more Jews than, there were about 65,000 Jews living in Vilna in the 1920s. And by the late, by the 1940, even more, 70,000 maybe, 75,000. Some people say 80,000 Jews. Uh, by 1940-41, when Germany finally attacked Russia, attacked uh, the Soviet Union, and attacked Vilna, and came into Vilna in the summer of 1941, and set up the ghetto, two ghettos, which were quickly shrunk into one, and began the mass killings that had, of course, begun to take place in the German zone before, but had not been a part of the Russian zone, not the mass killings. Um, so this is now this poet who had just gotten married before uh, the outbreak of the war. This is the poet now with all his friends, with his mother, with the whole rest of the Vilna community, is herded into the Vilna ghetto. And, um, and the mass killings begin. Now. Uh, uh, how, how to speak about this on one foot, uh, it, it is uncomfortable because um, one does not want to reduce this in any way, simplify it or, or compress it, but one has no choice. So I would just say that the person who Sutskever was is the person who he is in the ghetto. He continues to write. He writes under the most extraordinary circumstances. And what he begins to do is to date his poems, to date, to actually date the poems that he writes. Write a poem, you put the date on it, because time then becomes so fragile, and you know you don't know where tomorrow is, where you're going to be. And the death, the killing is so extreme. The Sutskevers, for example, give birth to their first child in the ghetto, a boy. But in the ghetto hospital, you're not allowed to have Jewish children. So the boy is smothered to death immediately. Right? And Sutzkever's mother is killed in the ghetto. And of course, the population begins to decrease uh, through mass shootings, through people being uh, taken out and, and uh, deported elsewhere. 
Um, it's a horrific time. And Sutzkever writes all kinds of poems within this structure. Basically, one of the things that he writes afterwards is, this is how he describes it. The angel of poetry appeared to be, the angel of poetry appeared to me, and the angel of poetry said, if you persuade me, I will protect you with a flaming sword. And if not, don't blame me. You understand this? In other words, he made a pact, as it were, or he didn't make that. The angel of poetry, uh, not the angel of religion, but religion in some kind of, or God in some kind of transposed form, made a, a deal with me. If your poetry is good enough, I will protect you with a flaming sword. But if your poetry is not good enough, don't blame me. You'll be as dispensable. You know, I, then, I, then I can't come to your protection as the angel of poetry. This is kind of harsh. I don't know. You see how, how complicated this is, how easy it would be to aestheticize this, mm -hmm. to say, oh, this, this is an aestheticist of some kind. Well, it isn't quite that, but it is an understanding that you see good and evil Good and evil are hard to distinguish in the ghetto. Uh, who are the most valuable people in the ghetto? Smugglers, thieves, right? I mean, everything is reversed. If, if evil is predominant, then, you know, in a sense, to stay alive or to do things, there compromise is necessary. I mean, every quality that you think is a good quality suddenly comes to be tested in a new way. But that is why the person who has already within himself developed an, a, a, an independence of judgment, an independent standard, is somehow... Um, this independent standard is inviolable. It cannot be violated. And in this sense, it is that Sutzkever really uh, survives the ghetto. And in the uh, very last period, he belongs to the partisans. I mean, it's not all on that level. Even as he is writing this and thinking these things, he becomes a member of the partisan group in Vilna. And in 1943, in September, uh, the partisans actually know that the ghetto is going to be uh, uh, destroyed. And so they escape through the sewers of Vilna and join partisan groups in the forest. And uh, a whole different chapter begins. He and his wife escape to the forest at that point and become partisans. And here is another sort of miraculous proof of what he has been saying. He smuggles out some of his poems with a Lithuanian partisan leader who brings them to Moscow. And in Moscow, there was the Jewish anti-fascist committee which is a whole chapter in itself, the people in the Jewish anti-fascist committee read these poems, are extraordinarily moved because this is the first living witness that they have to what is happening in Jewish world across the border. And so in 1944, spring, they send the Jewish anti-fascist committee and it's mostly El Ilya Ehrenberg who arranges this. They send a plane a small plane to a landing field near the forest, and Sutzkever and his wife, and an engineer who is also among them, are taken by plane to Moscow. Um, and in, uh, in Moscow, Sutzkever then has a, uh, there's an interview that El Ilya Ehrenberg runs on the front page of Pravda, and then they have a mass rally where he is the speaker, and this is the first news, right? This is the first open recognition of what has been happening to the Jews uh, uh, under uh, German occupation that comes to Moscow. So from 1944 to 1946, Sutzkever is in Moscow. He befriends all the great Yiddish writers and theater people and intellectuals of Moscow. He becomes kind of part of that Moscow Jewish intellectual circle. 
Peretz Markisch and David Bergelson and David Hofstein. I don't know if you know these names. And Der Nister. These are famous, famous writers and great people. And Schleimer Michoels, the people of the Moscow Yiddish Theater and so forth. He becomes a befriend of all of them. But because he is Polish, there is a um, in 1946, the Soviet Union allows Polish Poles who came to the Soviet zone, escaping from the Germans, allows them to be repatriated to Poland. And so the Sutzkevers leave back to Poland, go back to Vilna, then from there to Paris. And in 1947, uh, through the personal intervention of Golda Meir, Sutzkever is brought uh, to, is able to go on a ship called the Patria, is able to come to Palestine, even though the British were not allowing Jews to come to Palestine at that time. You, you had to have special permission, special certificates. They were given these special certificates, and he comes to uh, Palestine. He comes um, in uh, November of 1947. Right. So that is just a half a year before the creation of the State of Israel. Uh, so I would say that, um, you know, you could say that this is a life which touches on Jewish history of the 20th century at so many relevant points. It's almost like the in, uh, a microcosm of Jewish history of the 20th century. You could write about Sutzkever as the historical embodiment but why uh, do I think that that would be um, a little uh, strange is because, yes, he was very acutely aware of history and very much in contact with it, but because of what I've been saying, because of his own relationship to historical events, which is not one of succumbing to historical events, but rather of one of remaining independent to some extent of, of, of historical events. Nevertheless, this is a kind of, you, you see the paradox here, that he is at every point in Jewish history. Let me just say one other thing, that when the Nuremberg trials took place in 1946, Ilya Ehrenberg persuaded Stalin and those who were making the decisions that Sutzkever should be the witness on behalf of Russian Jewry. So Sutzkever is the only one who testifies at the Nuremberg trials on behalf of Jews. And he wanted to testify in Yiddish, but Yiddish was not one of the official languages of the Nuremberg trials, so he had to testify in Russian. And so he testifies, and you can see part of this on YouTube, and you can of course read the whole testimony because the, the Nuremberg uh, trials are available to be read in in, certainly in English and Russian, uh, the full transcript of the Nuremberg trials are available, so you can read the whole transcript, right? And you can see that in the, the, one, the one thing that he did, he wasn't able to speak in Yiddish, but when you look at him in that, in that thing, he stands like this. He refuses to sit as a witness. They want the witnesses to sit when they're giving testimony, but he stands like this. He will not, he will not sit giving witness. So yes, he's a witness to history and plays such an important role here, but, but, but his, his relationship to it is, is on, on a completely different level. So he comes then in 1947, and the first poem that I have here for you that I would like to look at with you is this poem that he writes in, um, dated in 1947, and it was published in a weekly newspaper of um, the displaced persons camp, right? Um, you know, Shomer Hatzair, the, um, the um, how was I say, uh, the, the, the labor Zionist, the left-wing labor Zionist organization in Palestine at the time, wanted to uh, uh, encourage the Jews in these displaced persons camps and to encourage them to come to Palestine, but also to encourage them as Jews, to give them some encouragement. So we put out a newspaper that was really distributed in the displaced persons camp. And so this is where this poem was 
published. First published, and then Sutzkever included it, of course, in his books. Um, a poem which was originally um, published without a, um, without a title, but then published in a, uh, under the title Shechion. So in Yiddish it would read like this. Wenn ich wollt nit sein mit dir beinand, nit ottemen das Glück und weder, wenn ich wollt nit brennen mit dem Land, vulkanisch Land in Hevle Lede, wenn ich wollt hat sind noch meiner Kede, nit mitgeboren mit dem Land, wo jeder Ständel is mein Seide, gesättigt wollt mich nit das Bräut, das Wasser nit gestillt mein Gummen, bis euch gegangen ich wollt vergeut, Und blois mein Bankschaft wollt gekommen. So you see that in, in English it's never been translated poetically. And in a sense, this is the hardest poem I know that I have ever found in Yiddish to translate. Uh, and, and we'll soon see why. So what is this strange poem? Well, Shehech Yonu is a prayer that one says on various occasions. Um, it is a prayer that one says, for example, at the beginning of a holiday, or the first time that you perform a certain mitzvah. Um, when you light the candles on Hanukkah for the first time, you say Shehech Yonu. The first time you eat a certain fruit. And it's a prayer that was said by people the first time they came to the land of Israel. So it is, uh, you thank God, Shehech Yonu, Vikimonu, Vihigionu, Lazman Hazeh. So this is that you have sustained us. Thank you, God of the universe. You have sustained us. You have enabled us. It's three verbs, right? You have granted us life. You have sustained us in life. And you have enabled us to reach this milestone that we are doing here. So what is this poem? It follows that tripartite quite uh, a form quite explicitly, wenn ich wollt nicht sein mit dir bei Land, nicht Ottoman das Glück und Vedo, wenn ich wollt nicht brennen mit dem Land, vulkanisch Land in Hevle Leder, wenn ich wollt hat Sinn nach meiner Kede nicht mitgeboren äh, mit dem Land. So it's the same three verbs, but there, yes. But see how strange this is. It's all in a negative qualified form. Not thank you for having brought me here, thank you for having sustained me, but in the, in the conditional sense, if I had not been brought here, if you had not sustained me, if I had not come here, what would then have happened? So the traditional blessing is pronounced in a way, but it's pronounced from the perspective of someone who almost did not make it. See? It's pronounced through the... The, because the greater possibility was of not having made it. You can't just come. I, I think you can't just come, uh, you know, post-war, out of the Vilna ghetto, when, you know, what, one out of ten? If, uh, fewer than that. You know, when, when, when uh, what, five percent of the population survived? And how many of those people who were killed did manage to reach the land of Israel? How can you come and say, oh, as a national expression? You know, it, 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 it's, it, 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 there's something wrong. Why? Because I made it? Therefore, I should pronounce it with this kind of full-throated joy? On the other hand, can I fail to bless this? I can't fail to bless it. I do bless it. I do feel that I, some, I have the privilege of having come. So how to express both these ideas in one? That this is a time of unique blessing, but that it is also, you have to speak in, in a sense, that carries with it the knowledge of how tenuous this is, how fragile this is, right? How improbable this is. So this is part of this Shehechionu. So, so he says, so if I were not with you, not breathing this joy and pain here, if I were not burning with this land, 
this volcanic land in Hevel Eleida, in its birth pangs. And this, of course, also refers to the fact that this land was being born in war, right? It was, it's not just heat, but it's also from the very beginning, the country had to fight for its life. So it was, Hevel Eleida is birth pangs. It's what you use for the birth pangs of a woman giving birth. But Hevel Eleida, by the way, is also the birth pangs of the coming of the Messiah. When you say the Hevel Eleida, the birth pangs of the coming of the Messiah, this is a mystical and a Kabbalistic term which is used as well. So if I were not here, if I were not after my Akeda, now I've been talking about the Akeda, right? So this is dramatic. What does it mean after my Akeda? Is he here the father who brought his child to the which, which part does he play in the Akeda? But it's as if he is coming after he has undergone this, uh, this experience of Abraham sacrificing his son. And if I were not reborn here with the land, where every pebble is my grandfather, is my Zayde. You see, it's not the wall that he's invoking here. It's not the Western Wall, it's not the Kotel Hamaravi and these great stone buildings and things, but, but it's, the, it's the fact that every pebble here is my grandfather, right? It's this, and my teacher, um, Uriel Weinreich, who was actually a student of poetics, of poetic theory and of poetics, he once pointed to this poem and pointed out how fantastic it was if you look at the rhymes, if you look at the four rhymes of the first uh, A, B, A, B, B, A, B, a very strange rhyme scheme, but very interesting. Veda in line two, Hevlelede, Akede, and Zede, he pointed out that in a sense, this is a poem which brings together everything in Jewish experience, but it also does this through rhymes from all levels of the Yiddish language. Veda from the German, right? Hevla Leda from the uh, Aramaic aspect of Hebrew, Akeda from the biblical aspect of Hebrew, and Zede from Slavic. Is Djadje? Right, uh, this is the term for uh, grandfather. So, hmm? so, so it's so, and that's where Zadik comes from. So you see how the the motif of the poem is brought to life through the rhyming scheme itself. Okay, so all these knots. If it were not all these things, then what would have happened? Then we have the conclusion. So, gesättigt wollt mich nicht das Brot. Bread would not have stilled my hunger, and water would not have stilled my thirst, until oisgegangen gewollt vergeut. Now, this is extraordinary. This is why it, you can't translate this. What is vergeut? There, is, there was never such a word in Yiddish. Goy is the word for other nations. Goyim are the nations. And a goy, I mean, some people think that it's used negatively. Not necessarily. You say a goy is a non-Jew. But here, what Sutzkov is saying, what would have happened, he doesn't say I would have died, but I would have ceased to be turned into a Gentile. Fargoit. It's a very, it comes as if it were a verb. It's, it's formed so naturally that you can't understand that this is a neologism because all Yiddish verbs are actually formed in that particular way. But he just turns this into a verb, turned into a Gentile. So it's actually not, I would have been slaughtered. Oh, I would have been Gentiled. That's what would have happened to me. If, if I had not come here, here to this land, 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 if I were not with you, this land, 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 in, in the rhyming position, in, in, in those first lines. But even that is not the end. It's not the last line. The last line is very different. So I would have expired, 
turned into a non-Jew. But, und bloß mein Bengschaft wollt gekommen. But my longing for this land would have come independently of me. So you see, the metaphysical here is, um, I find it such a, a powerful poem in many ways, and one could say so, so much more about it, and but perhaps, perhaps you can translate it into Russian more powerfully. I mean, it's, po it's possible that it would lend itself. <clears throat> but but you, you see, that my, my, my longing would, even if I had not come here, and if I had not been reborn in this particular way, my longing would have come on its own. In other words, the longing for this land, so powerful, it would have come anyway. And in a way, what that does is it allows for the longing of all those who actually did not come. It's almost as if those who did not live to see it, there the longing comes on its own. He gives that possibility of speaking for that, for something in them that still, that still uh, persists. Uh, so this is, um, th this is uh, Sutzkefer at that particular moment. And then coming to uh, Israel, I mean, he writes about every aspect of life. He, he, uh, he writes about the desert. He writes about the people here. He, uh, in the, when there's a war, he accompanies the generals into battle, and he writes poems about that. Um, he is, but, but in terms of our subject here, he does something that some people consider to be even more remarkable than what he does as a poet. In, uh, as soon as he comes to Israel, now you know, you'll, if you don't know now, one of the things you'll learn about or hear more about is the language war in this country. So one of the things that had to be done in Israel, I think that the greatest urgency in building this country, in reclaiming this country, not just from others uh, who had, uh, you know, this country was under foreign occupation for 2,000 years, right? The land of Israel is under foreign occupation for 2,000 years. So in order to reclaim a country after 2,000 years of foreign occupation by various other occupying forces, it's a difficult enough task physically. But you also had the Jews living everywhere, and every Jewish community is different from every other, and speaking all these different languages. And Yiddish in particular is a language which was spoken in 1939 by 10 million Jews which is almost as many Jews as there are in the world today. It was a very powerful language, right? And I've told you about how it figured in the life of Vilna Jews, for example, and Ladino in the life of other Jews and other communities. So in order to consolidate this country, you needed the only language that unites the Jews in time and in space is the Hebrew language. And it's not just that the government decided to impose Hebrew. You can't impose an, a language by force. I think that can be shown. It's, it's impossible to I impose a language by force. It, the people have to participate in this. It's a natural, much more natural process than government can uh, define. Um, so I think people spontaneously understood that one would have to come together in Hebrew, difficult as that was. Right, um, But what does this mean? So I would say that it was imperative and it was inevitable that Hebrew should become the language of, uh, of the Jewish people once they return to their homeland and it should be brought back into life as a living language. By the way, this has never happened in the history of linguistics. There's no other example of a high status, a language which has been pushed into a high status position being reclaimed as a living language of, 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 of vernacular daily discourse. So the whole thing is really an amazing story, the story of Hebrew. But in the meantime, you are a Yiddish poet. You are the most inventive Yiddish poet. You have created all these rhymes. You have created all this, you know, how, what is your role? 
I mean, it's an amazing moment. So Sutzkever, when he comes, the first thing he does is he sets up a, 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 um, a journal, a quarterly journal called Die Goldene Kate, the Golden Chain, that refers to the golden chain of Jewish tradition. And Die Goldene Kate, which continues for 50 years, is the, I would say, without a question, the most astonishing journal in the history of Yiddish literature. Founded in Tel Aviv in 1949, but he had to start working on it almost the minute that he came. People said to him, you will never get this done. At the time when they're trying to get Hebrew consolidated as the national language and trying to get people to stop speaking Yiddish and stop using Yiddish because they have to move into Hebrew, you think you're going to found a Yiddish literary journal in this country? Never. And he got the Histadrut, which was the Jewish labor union, but basically a labor union that represented the country. He got them to fund the Golden Akkade and to do so. And every Yiddish writer, Bashevis Singer and Sholem Ash, and every writer, and writers who had stopped writing Yiddish began to write again to publish in the Golden Akkade. And writers in Israel began to write Yiddish and publish in the Golden Akkade and so forth. So, in a sense, inspired this whole renaissance of Yiddish, even at the moment here in, in Israel, because, in a sense, Yiddish could testify to something which Hebrew could not. Um, this poem that I read with you today is not something that could have been written in Hebrew. He Hebrew was experiencing something very, very different. You can read all the Hebrew poets of that time, and there are some very great ones. They couldn't write this. This is not their experience. So, in a way, he has to write this for, for the Yiddish for the Yiddish world that was brought into this country. And he becomes the voice of that, even at a moment when everybody is saying, you can't do it, it can't be done. Everything is against it. Um, okay, so then, um, of all that one can say about Sutzkever in this last time, I would just go to um, the masterpieces. In 1974, so you would have to, there are, by the way, there are, uh, two uh, collect volumes of collected works of Sutzkever, but even after the collected works, there are so many other volumes of poetry. So if you are interested in him, there's now a growing body of translation of Sutzkever, and um, uh, you know, it'll speak for itself. In 1974, he began to write uh, a series of poems, which some people consider to be uh, the high point of his poetic uh, life, and they are called Poems from a Diary. Poems from a Diary. Now, this is a very strange formulation, also paradoxical, because a diary, you know, is a, a prose form of just your thoughts, your everyday thoughts. Poems are something that you craft, right? So what are poems from a diary? Well, poems from a diary are precisely this. Everyday things, everyday language, sort of colloquial things, but basically my thoughts on a daily basis um, crafted into poems. I'm not sure my choice here is the best. It could have been one of many, many poems, but I'll just, we'll read this one together, but it's a, one of the famous poems of this series, Poems from a Diary. So this is from 1974, from the first year of the writing. And he continued to write them for many years, into the 80s, into the 1980s. Wer wird bleiben? Was wird bleiben? Bleiben wird der Wind. Bleiben wird die Blindkeit von dem Blinden, was verschwindt. Bleiben wird das Simmen von dem Jam, a Schnirrl Schäum. Bleiben wird der Wolkendl, was scheppert auf a Bäum. Wer wird bleiben? Was wird bleiben? Bleiben wird der Traf. Bereich es dick, a Reus zu grosen, wieder sein Baschaf. Bleiben wird der Fiesel Reus, le Covid sich allein. Sieben Großen von die Großen wollen sie verstehen. Mehr von alle Sternen, Asch von Soffen bis daher, bleiben wird der Stern, was er fällt in seine Träger. Ständig wird der Tropfen Wein euch bleiben in sein Krug. Wer wird bleiben? Gott wird bleiben. Ist dir nicht genug? So, the, the, the question 
is the question, if you're in Yiddish literature and you study Yiddish, believe me, this is the question you will be asked every time you get up to speak, every time you write a, a paper, everybody will say, what will remain? What will remain? What will remain of Eastern European Jewry? What will remain of Yiddish? What will remain? What will remain? What will remain? So this is the question with which he begins. So what do you think? What do we decide will stay? You have to, in order to see what he's doing here, you have to think, what do we do? Oh, have you seen the Memorial Museum of the Holocaust in Washington, DC? Yes. Have you seen in every city now this memorial, and this memorial, and that memorial, and that museum, and this? I mean, some of them are quite glorious. I mean, I was in the museum in Moscow. I wouldn't do without it. It's a, there's much to say about that. What a strangely amazing museum that is. And the new Jewish museum in Poland, which is really a work of, uh, I think, the greatest Jewish museum in the world, as far as I can, you have, you'll forgive me, Betat uh, Futsot and all the rest. I don't want to be disloyal, but it really is a, a, an extraordinary thing. But you see what most people think. What's going to remain? What's going to remain? A book. Something tangible, 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 we think. And deliberately as if you say, Blyden, the wind, the most insubstantial part of nature, a wind will play. And the blindness of a blind man who disappears. Right? The, the essence of this blind man, the blindness will remain, even though the blind man himself will be gone. And a a sign of the sea, a schnirl, a schnirl schoim. You know, you have the oceanic forces, right? And the only thing that will remain is that little, you know, when the tide goes out, and the only thing that is left is that little, little rim of foam that is left on the strand. That's what's going to remain. That's in the first, in the first stanza. In the second stanza, he go, turns to language. What will remain? There again, you would think my collected poems will remain. You know that after the war, every destroyed community, one of the first things that people did was to put out memorial books. If you go to the libraries, you will find hundreds and hundreds of volumes of to this community, that community, memorial volumes. No, in this he says, bleiben, bleiben wird das traf, a syllable will remain. And Bereshistik, in a Genesis way, it's going to grow like the way grass breaks through pavement, right? It will grass out, it will regenerate its own creation. This one syllable, right? Bleibel wetter Fiedelroys, a fiddle rose, which is a, a symbol that Sutzkever uses more than once. The fiddle is a, a, an, an instrument, a musical instrument. The rose, of course, a natural thing of beauty. A fiddle rose, a kind of magical combination of fiddle and rose. And yeah. that will play for itself alone, for its own thing. And seven grasses of the grasses will understand it. And then, and then turning upwards, right, to the heavens, to the metaphysical realm, more than all the stars from the north until here. The, 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 the star will last that will fall into a human tear. There will always be a drop of wine left in the dregs that you drain to the very end. So you have not the beaker of wine, not the cup of wine, not this, but what you've something you've drained to the very dra to the very end, one drop will always remain, and then that totally unexpected last line. Uh, who will remain? God will remain. Isn't that enough for you? In the most colloquial, offhand way. Well, what, are you, what are you thinking of here? You're better. You want more. You want assurances. Uh, right. Um, so, on the other hand, uh, you know, so would you say this is a religious poem? 
or almost, what, what is it? Is it a humanistic poem? Is it a, um, do you feel the, the negative aspect or the affirmative aspect of this poem? Uh, how, how does one interpret that? The, the minimalism, the minimalism of your sensibilities, cultivate it, cultivate it. Don't look at the missing. Don't, don't look at the missing, look at the regenerative. Just, just, you have, to, you have to look beyond, you have to feel what's deeper than, as it were. Uh, even though, as I say, all these poems are really about meeting Pasternak and about a child who uh, does something during the day, I mean, they're all very uh, daily occurrences. But then when it comes to speaking beyond this, if you want to make a sahakal, you say, if you want to make a generalized uh, 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 thing, one has to come back to this. This is where it begins, and this is what you have to, you have to learn that satisfaction. You have to really feel that, that thing. So uh, I think that poetry has always been preoccupied with establishing permanence uh, in a world of flux. Um, and nobody understood flux better than this poet who lived with ultimately the disappearance of an entire world, right? Um, and you come to something which is so substantive and everybody here is interested in building and in building permanence out of impermanence. And at, at precisely this kind of moment, you build a poem which invites you to say, yes, of course we understand that, but don't ever, don't ever lose track of, you know, the, 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 the main thing, which is the, the only permanence, essentially, the only permanence in which one can basically uh, uh, place a trust. <clears throat>